For the sake of this report, my name shall be Jones. I am 42 years old, and since I was a teenager, I always had problems with accepting the established rules when it comes to a society. I wasn't a rebel without a cause by any means. I simply didn't believe in living a life of submission. And for what? Governments are corrupt, and all sorts of respected authority, both public and private, treat people like sheep and pieces of boarding chess. Yes, I was born an intelligent individual, so even during my youth I was questioning the world that surrounded me. When it came for me to finally start earning my own money, I already had a few ideas. At first I was buying and selling all sorts of items, both used and new, books, music records, video games. I had my own small place, and I would also meet people at their homes for the transactions. It wasn't bad. The money wasn't too much, but it was still coming, and I was making some kind of profit. For starters, it was enough for me to feel excited about the prospect of relying on my independence and creativity. However, I was thirsty. I needed more money. And as my ideas supported free will and the right of the individual to decide for himself, I started selling. Obviously, the money was even better, but it came with a problem. I realized I was being seduced by those and I didn't want to become an addict myself. My own decision, precisely. So I left that life. I was now searching for another, liberal business. I met a guy who had fascinating ideas about anarchy as a political system. Let's call him Henry. Can you imagine the society breathing without government, without police, without any kind of oppressive institution? churches, big companies, Henry would say. But then, it would be chaos, right? I argued. At first, yes. But it's like everything in life, the universe itself. After chaos comes balance, and with balance comes fairness. In due time, all social groups would simply make peace among themselves. And freedom! Wars wouldn't need to happen because there would be no more political and economical interests behind them. Henry was actually making good points. I think I follow you, man, I said. But for that, we need guns, Jones. To sell them, to spread them out there. That's the business I'm into now. But don't worry, I don't sell them to everyone, only to people and organizations that have similar ideas, that want to make things right. I'm now working with some guys who call themselves Fury for Freedom. I'm selling them some guns. If you want to work for me, Jones, you will be receiving a lot of money and doing something good at the same time. What do you say? Henry proposed. Okay, I'm in, I replied. My friend Henry explained to me how it worked. I was to dwell into the dark web through an illegal site and then deal with the people from Fury for Freedom, discussing prices, types of guns, how many, etc. Henry gave me the keys to a warehouse which had a secret underground floor. There, I could get access to the guns. How they got in there, I never asked. By driving a truck, I was able to put the guns inside the truck, and then I would take them to the guys from Fury for Freedom. And this is what I did. After reaching an agreement through our dark web communications, I was now driving my truck to finally meet the gentleman from Fury for Freedom. Once I arrived to the address they gave me, I was in for a surprise. It was a huge, luxurious mansion. They opened the gates and let me in. I was given directions to park my loaded truck inside a big garage, which I did. I was nervous. There were about eight individuals. One of them, a woman, no older than 30 years old, ordered me to get out of the truck after it was parked. Hello, welcome my fellow freedom fighter. Call me Donna, she said, shaking my hand. The woman was friendly and quite attractive short blonde hair, and big fiery brown eyes. I quickly understood she was the leader of the gang. The remaining individuals were now expecting the contents of the truck. I had brought about a hundred guns, from simple 9mm to machine guns. After confirming that everything was fine, I was paid. Here, some extra for you, Donna said, as she gave me an additional $500. Call it a tip. Thank you, I said genuinely grateful. Then Donna invited me to come inside the house. Her fellows, all men from 20 to 50 years old, give or take, came with us. 
I was served vodka and caviar. I assumed Donna had some Slavic origins, probably, although her accent didn't reveal it, if being the case. As we were eating and drinking, I was getting a nice session of Fury for Freedom propaganda, agreeing with part of it, but thinking, these guys are a little bit too much. Oh well, better than the government still. And suddenly, I was about to be questioned about that. We heard shots from outside the house. Massive shots, not your average handgun. Someone came in the house, one of Donna's guards. He was bleeding, badly. The police is here! Special forces, we're doomed! Donna was livid. You brought them with you, bastard! Traitor! She screamed at me. No, I didn't! I shouted back, sincerely. In a few minutes, the special forces were spread around Donna's property, outdoors and indoors. Better trained and benefiting from the element of surprise, they killed or captured all of the members of Fury for Freedom, at least those who were at the mansion. As for Donna, she chose to die with a gun from her own hand, not so far away from where I was. The government's troops didn't play safe and spread Donna with a massive blaze of semi-automatic shooting. She was dead within seconds, and some of her blood was spilled right onto my face. I felt terrible for all the reasons and more. Ironically, in spite of bringing all those weapons with me to the property, I can barely shoot a gun. So I wasn't armed and surrendered immediately. It wasn't even an option. It was the only possible outcome. Once the beasts from the special forces looked at me, they probably realized how scared I was shaking with my hands up. For sure, I don't have that kind of look in my eyes, the one of a soldier or a fighter. Later on, I learned what happened. My friend Henry was caught by the police doing illegal business months ago. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he became their double agent. Henry was the typical two-faced rat. I obviously fell for it and became his puppet, without knowing, of course. I went to trial, was found guilty, and now I'm serving 20 years in prison. And I hate the government more than ever. Nowhere is a place on the internet where you can find entertainment like everywhere else. I was told. It is really easy to find if you have been told about it. Now you are being told about it. I would advise you don't get curious. I was curious when I was told about it, even though I was warned. It is not as confusing as it looks. This is a straightforward story of nowhere on the internet, and how not to find it. I had an eerie feeling when I logged into my computer that evening, facing an atmospheric teal page with directions on how to access nowhere. Carlos had told me about it, and his testimony had been simple. He had gotten nowhere from some other friend of his who had gotten into it from some game. It was all a mess when Carlos tried to explain after a couple bottles of liquor. He was reticent sober anyway, so you never really got much off of him. The promise was a simple bet between the host of Nowhere and the participant. The game was determined by the host, but it was always simple, Carlos had explained to me. If the visitor to Nowhere wins the game, they would get cash, lots of cash. Carlos said that he had heard of it. They would have delivered it to you after the game. There was a tempting prospect to it. Everything was possible on the dark web if you look hard enough. Yet, it was there on the front page of the screen, a flickering icon on the topmost right corner of my screen, the promise of more money than I could imagine. If anyone had won that much money, how is it possible no one has ever heard of it? I wondered to myself as I blankly watched the screen load. I shrugged my shoulders and dismissed the thought when it occurred to me that it was on the dark web and word almost never got out of such things. Well, here we go, I said in a muffled breath as I leaned close to my computer. I rubbed my hands together and felt it clammy so I wiped it all the way back to clear the nervous perspiration. When I was done, I slowly ran my fingers over my keypad 
and typed in the instructions into the column that was specified for it. Easy. Please wait as we redirect you to nowhere. Those were the words that reeled over my page as I waited. I wasn't always given to imagination, but on that occasion, I had cause to. If I had ever gotten a whole box of cash with that much value at no extra cost to me, what would I do with it? I paused and thought. The question lingered in my head as I toyed with my keypad. It was a mess. Stupid. I scoffed as I read through the directions and my screen suddenly went blank. Then, it came on in a flood of lights. Hello? A tiny voice echoed from the other end of the speaker. Hey there, I whimpered, uncertain as to my own expectations even as I awaited the game. I assessed the canvas on my screen, the silhouette of a smallish figure, albeit human. The background itself was gray, a crude shade that appeared grainy on my screen. I clutched my fingers together and cleared my throat. How did you find nowhere? The voice came again, this time with the freakish outline of what I assume was the face. I blanched at the first horrible features. Then I smiled, assuming it to be some terrible prank on me. The man's face was tan, so much that he appeared brown that he did white, which I could see from the undersides of his wrinkled cheeks. He had a horrible droop on both sides of his face, heavy and forlorn. Even the skin of his forehead drooped, hanging over each of his eyes like saggy sachets. On each of his brows to hold up the sagging skin was a thicket forest of brows. He smiled. I shrugged. It had to be a mask, I thought to myself. There was nothing in this world so hollow as the man's eyes, as I felt my stomach tighten of their own natural accord as I pressed my attention firmly to the screen before me. He was horribly ugly, but it was not his ugliness which made him so unsettling as much as his demeanor. I detached from the aura which poured in surplus from the screen and found myself struggle to push breath down my chest. Um, I tried to clear my head, conjuring an answer for him. A friend mentioned. The last player? He quizzed. The last player, I retorted, scowling as I tried to recall if Carlos had told me he had played himself. I had not heard from him in days. There can only be one player per recommendation, you see, the host revealed. I nodded. He smiled whirly. It was nothing like the first time when he did smile. There was a shallowness that betrayed his position. Still, I was glued to the screen. You wish to play a game at nowhere, don't you? He said. Sure. Meet me at these coordinates in three hours, the host of nowhere said, and immediately dropped off a location as my screen suddenly went blank. I sighed. It would be easy money as I swept myself to my feet and plugged my earphones into my ears to meet with the host of nowhere. This morning, I woke up in a blood-stained shirt. The first time was three days ago when I arrived at nowhere and I was seized. The first morning was the worst. I had a horrible dream. Before my dream, I had had a horrible day. I had to kill a man to live. I have since killed three. My stomach held in the air of its own accord too feebly and I retched instinctively. Nowhere had promised me a simple game, and they had lied. I was captive in the twisted course of gains that Carlos never told me about. Fucking moron, the man who wrestled beside me said. He was tall and dark. I did not look at him in the face. I was weary of it. It was too much familiarity for a man that I was supposed to kill. He seemed to take it in his stride and I did not feel the tragedy in his voice when he neared me. It was all entertainment for nowhere and those who financed it. 
I was a character in a game with other humans whose lives were disposable like characters in a video game. It was a misery I could not bear to live for too long. I placed my hands under my pillow and withdrew the knife when he was close to me. I turned the knife backwards and slashed where I sensed his neck was. He grunted and fell on me. The host of nowhere chuckled through the speakers maniacally. That was beautiful. Now, get off your bed. You have won the prize money. The night had a dizzying aura to it. The swirling tip of cigarette smoke swirling across the desk that separated me from the bartender as he whipped a cocktail for a customer who sat two seats to my right. The heavy air of nostalgia that always returned with every Halloween made me aware of all the motions in the room. I turned my neck to face the small dais at the center of the bar, and there she was, the singer, crooning into the night like an angel recounting a debauched incident of sex on a beach. I fancy no one took too much notice of me as I did of the room. I enjoyed the anonymity well enough, it served its purpose. My mind rallied back to the present, latching onto the bartender's finger around the cup as he wound the tall, shaking cup around and finally settled the drink in front of the customer. Perhaps she did not notice it, but his left little finger had a plaster around the cuticle. I tucked my left little fingernail away instinctively and grappled my drink from the base. I pushed the tip of the glass to my mouth and took a swig of the alcohol. It burnt down my throat with a sting. When I returned my gaze to the table, she was staring at me. I blushed. I fancy you enjoy your own company more than most people do, she said to me, pressing for a conversation which I had not known to allow before she spoke. Her body was turned to face me in rapt attention. That's Halloween. Some time for reflection, maybe. I said back to her with a smile on the left corner of my face. Hmm, introspective. I like that. So what are you supposed to be tonight? She asked, her brows jutting up her forehead and causing it to crease. Um, no, buddy. Just me, I replied. Can you guess what I am, then? She asked. She bobbed her hair over her shoulder and simpered as I assessed her briefly. I looked over my shoulder, and the room was distracted by the events of the evening. The only attention we got was from the bartender, who eavesdropped subtly. He looked familiar, but I would never mention it to her. I squinted as I drew in as much of her features as I could. She had an artificial brow attached to her face, loose and unkempt. But she had the better habit of making sure her hair was well tended to. It was thick and ginger. But her eyes were different colors, one green and the other blue. She affected some wrinkles on her face, which I considered well done. Her lips had a maroon stain on the side, drawn to resemble a blood-stained canvas. It was strange, but I had no idea what it was. Um, I don't think I do, I answered truthfully. Maggie the Drunk, she blurted. Her eyes lit up with such fascination when she spoke. I don't think I know who that is, I replied, feeling the heat of the alcohol starting to pool back into my mouth. She's a figure from the old world. They say she would seize children who strayed too far from home, and when she had them, she would slit their throats with a small pick, just enough to get some blood and then drink of it until those little pricks would turn white. She giggled jocularly, managing her attention between myself and the bartender. And you, what are you supposed to be? She added, questioning him. I turned to my drink and stirred in silence with my ears pitched to hear what he had to say. Richard Combs. Heard a podcast about him from the internet. They say he's on the loose. A serial killer with no pattern. Scary, isn't it? The bartender said, fascinated with his own narration as he was with telling the subject of the story. I wouldn't know him, she said dismissively, and threw her hands in the air as she took a sip of her drink. I had enough of the night and I took the last of my drink just before sliding the bartender his tip of $10 for the night. I belched the alcohol crudely and stood up for the night without attention for the rest of bargoers. 
The breeze was gentle on my face when I stepped out of the bar that evening, and I felt a powerfulness that overwhelmed me. I felt alive. I recognized the rush and knew I had to satisfy it even as I made my way to the car. There was only so much I could do in such a place as this where I was new in, I thought to myself as I devised a new plan for my week ahead. I marched to my car with the thoughts swirling in my head, distracting me from finding my car, when I heard the faint whisper from behind. I shuddered in the dark as I looked around to find bare nothingness in my trail. The bar was at least three minutes from where I stood. Still, it felt like a distant island to me when I was stranded at sea. I walked backwards briefly, and just as I turned around, the ginger-haired costume was before me. What are the odds that you're being stalked by someone who wants the taste of your blood on her tongue right now? She asked rhetorically. I looked around and twitched. We were all alone. The feeling of powerfulness surged in me, pumping my muscles and causing my veins to spasm with a sudden rush of blood. I would place them very high, she said to me as she moved in with a small knife in her fingers. I said nothing. I could not. I was already pale with breathlessness, and my nose was hot with anticipation as I stared into her eyes to see her carelessness. I felt my head spin, and I lost my own consciousness like one possessed to speak. Ha ha ha! She bucked into a chuckle. Look at you, almost white with dread. You should see your eyes. I was just kidding. May I see your knife? I said to her as she moved closer. Sure, she said and handed over the knife to me. My name's Maggie. Reason for the choice on Halloween. What's yours? My eyes lit up. Richard Combs. Who? She asked, suddenly curious. Richard Combs, I said, slipping my left hand from the dark to have a firm grip on the knife. I tucked the knife quickly into my hand and placed my plastered finger on the base. Oh, oh God, no, she cried when she saw the look on my face. I grabbed her arm before she could turn. The fury in my veins flooded my face and I was red with rage before I could put a lid on my emotions. I dug the knife straight into the left side of her neck and pulled it across. I withdrew the knife from her neck before I realized what I had done.